everybody, adoring fans and regular listeners, all five of you out there, uh, and all future fans who are going retro and uh, listening to all the old stuff sometime in the future. We are the Cinema Joes. Today we are two Joes and uh, one Joanne, or Joanna. There's myself here, my good buddy Justin, and our dear friend Kayla. Casey is indisposed, but he might be back for part two. We will do a kind of special two-parter with this movie. We're doing an initial discussion now, and then we'll have a two-part that will involve uh, Justin, a friend of his, and possibly Casey and a few other our guests, uh, but not myself. So for this initial discussion, we decided that we wanted to first look at the question of, in terms of the movie Gone Girl, uh, there's been debates, controversies raging and flying um, across all sides. Is this movie feminist? Is it anti-feminist? Is it misogynistic? Is it not? Uh, or is it perhaps anti-guy or anti-masculinity? So to start off, we're going to first tackle the question, is this movie, or do, it, do we think of this movie, is any of those things? Yeah, we should probably throw up a giant spoiler alert here. So we're going to get. Yeah, it, this is one of those movies that you cannot have any serious discussion about without discussing anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Kayla, would you like to start? Um, I, re I read the book first because I wanted to, I wanted to read it before I saw the movie, and I read a couple articles, and I really don't think that this movie is particularly feminist, and I don't think it's particularly misogynistic. I think it's pretty neutral on that. I see it more as a character study. Mm. I mean, I'm, I would classify Amy Dunn without a doubt as a feminist. I'm sure she believes that women are just as good as men. But her actions are personal. They have nothing to do with the gender of who she's punishing. It just has to do with the fact that someone, in this case her husband, did something wrong to her. He wronged her he'll suffer. One of the biggest things is that in the book, her first known victim is a girl. Is a girl in her boarding school that got a couple better grades than her, and then a boy called her instead of calling Amy. So Amy threw herself down a flight of stairs and said the girl pushed her. But they okay. didn't have that in the movie, so in the movie it just looks like she's punishing all the men that have wronged her. Okay. No, she punishes everyone who wrongs her, like Nick that's, says, like an Old Testament God. That's uh, oh, that, that that's an interesting difference. The fact that it really is just the guys in the movie, but it, it's as you said, it's mixed in the book. I I purposely tried to not read the book before I saw this this movie, but it's interesting you mention that because you do see some tension between her and her mother um, early on, um, which is. It's hard to read a lot from that. There seems to be some kind of hostility. That's if we believe that this section, which is really part of the diary that she's writing, is to be believed. That is um, the key. That and is the key. honestly, yeah. that's why I feel like that's one of the reasons why I love this movie so much. Like I, this was probably this is probably one of my favorites from this year. Honestly, is because it plays with this idea of what's true. You know what's true what's false does it matter is it you know are we always uh you know is it this constant performance that we always have to keep up even to ourselves yeah i don't know i just i think that's interesting because i you can see there's some tension between her and other female characters yeah she, she holds on. herself superior to them yeah right yeah. so there is yeah. I, so i did see a little bit of that nothing as direct you know as direct as you know, blaming the, the girl for pushing down by the stairs. But yeah, but there there certainly is that. There's something going on with with her in terms of other not just male characters but female characters as well. In the film and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think it's I think it's interesting to note that throughout the entire film, with all the conversations between Nick, his sister, the lawyer the detective, the police officer, the news people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The question is never really asked, what is the truth of the matter? The constant question is, how will this action or that action be perceived? And or how could we spin that to get a certain perception? So 
both in terms of the marriage dynamics and even in terms of the relationships of these individuals to society as a whole is not so much about what is reality. It's about how can we convince others to perceive things a certain way or prevent them from perceiving ways, perceiving things in a way that is not advantageous to us. So mm. that's why I kind of feel, I personally feel that the discussion of whether or not the film is feminist or misogynistic or pro or, or anti-woman is really besides the point because it's really not about that any more any more than it's a movie about rape cases. Um, I don't think that the fact that she simulates rape, I don't think is meant to be. And I said this in my review as well. I don't think that's meant to be a commentary on actual rape cases. It's simply an example of here's how far this this one person is willing to go to create a perception and to create an image. Yeah, it's with Amy. It's never. There's no other motive than to get what she wants. I've read in several places that they think that Amy is feminist because she's rebelling against this personality that Nick forced on her. And it's possible it's clearer in the book, but Amy says herself that she was knowingly playing this part to be mm -hmm. the cool girl. She never said that Nick forced her to do it, all she says is that Nick fell in love with that person, and then when she decided to be herself, he's like, I don't know who you are, and she got mad at him for that. So I never I never saw her as really breaking free of her identity. I just saw her as, you know, she fell into the trap of pretending to be liked. It's more of a general yeah. societal, not yeah. Nick specifically telling her, yeah. I want you to be this person. No, she, she was acting the minute she met him. And, you know, a lot of people do that. So what she's really punishing him for is cheating. Because that's unacceptable. Amy is the only one that he should be with. Amy is the best. There's no reason he needs a 23-year-old bimbo. Amy is amazing. I think that's definitely, yeah, I think, you're, I think you're right. It's definitely a huge part of it. But I think it is maybe even more than that. I mean, she she talks about how she talks about moving to Missouri, moving away from her parents, feeling like she's not, like, he's not paying any attention to her, like she's just kind of there and he does what he wants. There's all these things, and again, this is, this is, some of this is in a diary, which we get that's, you know, again, very suspect, but it's one of the only things we have to go on you get the sense this is a this is a person, Amy, who who's probably been performing her entire life. Mm -hmm. And but I think what I find really fascinating about her is that she's perfor it, she's performing for a perceived motive, but it changes so often that you almost wonder is this person is the performance itself almost an end in itself? Mm -hmm. And I think you see that especially uh, later on when she has to constantly adjust. Yeah, she, you, know, you, see her, you really see her improvise on the spot, and you see her panic when something really doesn't go according to plan and she gets mugged, basically. Yeah. And I really, there's, there's a lot, there's so much murky about this character that it's almost like, I don't think we can really, it's hard to pin down the thing that even when, because we know she's unreliable, when she tells us something, like she tells us directly, like, he cheated on me, that's, the reason why I'm doing this. This is the same person who wrote this diary that's, you know, that we can't trust. Why are we trusting her narration now? She's a mm -hmm. constant performer. And, um, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, I mean, that's part of why I love it. I think it, it doesn't, it never tries to really pin down the truth. It just, I think like you were saying, Noah, it's more about what is, what is the perception? The perception is more important than the truth. Yeah. yeah. The, the other thing I really love about this movie is that and the book is that Nick is an asshole. You feel bad for him because, you know, nobody should be framed for murder. But he's yeah, an yeah. asshole. You know, yeah. he moved he admits that he moved her to Missouri and would like didn't give her a choice. He admits that he cheated on her. He admits he was a lousy husband. Mm -hmm. And so you have so the viewer kind of has to battle this he is more likable in the movie, but you do have to battle this sympathy for someone that you know 
deserves a little punishment, though not to the extreme that his wife is doling it out. Uh, yeah, and to the same extent, you can understand certain aspects of Amy's anger. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the big cool girl speech, I think that is something that a lot of, you know, that a lot of girls and women would and can identify with in terms of having that anger over having the feeling or having the sense that you have to conform to an image. So at the same time with Amy, you can understand and you can justify perhaps some of how she's feeling. Yeah. But just like with Nick, you can't go all the way and forgive him entirely as a person. You can't go all the way and justify what Amy does. Yeah. Uh, but on that note, something that I want, I, I'd like to ask you guys about, because um, there's something, a phrase that struck me in uh, one of the articles that I was reading over earlier, to sort of like freshen up for this discussion. Uh, and it talks about how she felt trapped in a certain gender identity by Nick, and then how she later, be, and this is the this is the specific phrase it used. She became trapped again in another version of herself by a former lover, which is the guy played by Neil Patrick Harris. Desi. Now here's yeah, Desi. Now here's my question. So the, that article went on the assumption that the reason why she suddenly comes up with a new plan to kill Desi and make this dramatic escape and go back to Nick and basically complete this perfect ending, which really seems to be made on the fly. The assumption this article was making, and I think a lot of people made, was she felt trapped again, like she felt that she was once again in danger. However, in all of the scenes uh, that we see with her and Desi, we don't see him coerce her in any way or say that he expects her to prepare him breakfast and serve him breakfast uh, on his fine, probably handmade dishware in his mansion out somewhere. We never see him try to coerce her into playing this sweet serving girl version of herself that she puts on for him. Uh, she seems to just spontaneously decide to do that as part of a new performance. So I want to ask if you guys, either of you guys had that impression as well, or if, or if you perhaps noticed something that I missed that would suggest that Desi was actually becoming threatening. Well, I think that the main thing about Desi is... You do hear from Nick that he apparently tried to commit suicide in her bed. Amy actually made that up. He did not try to do that. It is also important to remember, though, that Desi is creepy, and he's got an obsession. He really does. Um, I wouldn't call him threatening. I always felt that the main catalyst for her going back to Nick was that he started acting the way she wanted him to. She yeah, started saying, yeah, he started saying all the right things. He started praising her again, admitting his his mistakes. He was essentially opening himself up for humiliation, which she loved. So, mm -hmm. she she did feel trapped by Desi, but who's to say what she she might have just killed him and went somewhere else if Nick mm -hmm. hadn't started acting the way she wanted him to. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the thing, because I think it, it, it just, it struck me as more playing with expectations. Because the setup of her being with him, in any typical movie, he would be a rapist or a murderer. The way he's setting up with, he has this perfect location, he's completely out of sight. Oh, and it has video cameras. And you know, he says these very calm things that have kind of, that could be interpreted in a threatening manner. So the film sets us up to believe that he is a threat or that he could become a threat or threatening. But I don't recall seeing anything in his behavior or in uh, the performance itself to suggest that. Uh, it seemed to me that Amy jumped again and said, oh, Nick's acting the way I, I want him to. I'm going to go back to him. Okay, uh, I have to think of a plan and I have to frame this guy for rape and kill him. I, I just wonder, I just wondered if, if you guys, either of you guys had similar reactions to that, to that part of the movie. Yeah, just uh, before I, I want to answer your question, though. I just I just want to ask, um, Kayla, you said that he doesn't like it's that Amy just made up that he committed suicide. Well, she she made up that he attempted suicide after their breakup in her bed because she's a narcissist, uh, pretty much. Because like I don't remember if they ever like. I mean, I don't. Well, it was it never movie. came out in the movie about okay. whether it was true. Mm. Um, okay. I was gonna say, I'm like, I don't know yeah. what I'm saying. I, 
Yeah, the reading the book has made it hard for me to remember where things okay. happen. But yeah. it, it is it is made up in the book. Um, and actually, in the book, he's even creepier. Like, okay. she goes... She goes to the house, and he's got, like, an indoor tulip garden, because that's her favorite flower. And he's got, like, the bedroom all painted pink and stuff, and I was like, oh, obsessions. Wow. Oh, Not man. right. To go to your question, though, Noah, I think we get definite signs that there's something wrong with this guy, and that he does, whether he's a threat or not, I think that's open to interpretation, but there's definitely something going on uh, in terms of what he wants from her, that is decidedly eerie, and I think that she thinks it's a threat. From the get-go with the uh, closed-circuit television cameras, you have one of the th first things he says to her is, you know, oh, you can you can go down to the, you know, you can go to the gym, get back in shape, and you'll be like yourself again. That's not going to fly with Amy Dunn. And the scene that the scene that I love is later on when they're watching the. The broadcast of Nick's interview, you have Amy eating this, I guess, I don't know if it's like ice cream or frozen yogurt or something. Something rich. Something funny something people. Very it, it is not, let's say it's not non-fat Greek yogurt. <laughs> yeah. And there's just, there's just great little moments of, of Desi taking stuff out of her hands. Like once when she has the remote, he takes that out of her hands. He takes the dessert out of her hands. She, I think she like goes on the laptop to try to see something to that her. And I love like I love her reactions to each one of those cases because you can tell like she is just not having any of that. But she's just like holding up her hands like she still has it in her hands. You know, I actually forgot that. I I, I forgot and, that. Yeah. Yeah, and the key moment I think in that sequence is when he examines her hair. And it's almost like looking and like I think finds like a brown hair because she had dyed her hair. And just like plucks it out. You know, I actually, I actually thought that was a parallel to. Um, oh wait, I'm getting book and movie mixed up. It doesn't work because it wasn't in the movie. Okay, it's not a parallel. <laughs> Never mind. What Nick would do is he would take a strand of her hair, and like pull it down to the bottom and then tug twice. Hmm. And I, I forgot that didn't happen in the movie, so it's not a parallel. Because. Yeah. Uh, I kind of saw, like, expectation in her face. Like, she thought it, he was going to do what Nick did, and then I was like, wait, that didn't happen in the movie. Yeah, I mean, I think, Noah, you were saying before about just, like, how you didn't you didn't see, you didn't think he was, like, an overt kind of threat. I think that's part of what makes that character work so well, the Desi character, mm -hmm. is that he doesn't, that first night, he's not like, you know, all right, time to make love, time to make up for the lost time, you know, <laughs> something like that. But it's also about, it's, it's making her in an image that he wants. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's definitely there. Whatever Amy's reaction to that is, is immaterial. There's something, there's definitely something wrong. Um, well, that, that's the thing. We never really we never really do see him become explicitly threatening or domineering to that he point. He initiates the whole sexual encounter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He's, not, he's not prepared for that at all. You got that great yeah. moment earlier on when she bites his lip before he goes off to work. <laughs> <He's just> like, <laughs> I really wondered if she if she bit him she to, to show I like to now. Yeah. I wondered if she bit him so that, you know, when a medical examiner got to his body they would be like, Oh, she struggled. She didn't want to kiss him. He hmm. tried to kiss her and she bit him. I, I, I don't know. I can't read that woman. Actually actually okay, on that note, because I actually can't recall this, do you guys know if uh, Desi says that there were cameras everywhere, including inside the house, or only no. on the ground. On the it was system. only at the doors. Yeah, just oh, like okay. the perimeter of the of the. Okay. Yeah, that's why she the went to the door and like screamed into the camera. Okay, because I I seem to recall him saying that everything was under surveillance. Uh, so when she initially said to like the FBI agents. Okay, go, please, find those tapes. I was like, uh, wait a second. Those are going to expose you, you idiot. Uh, <laughs> but maybe if... It, I guess that was something that I, I didn't quite pick up on or, or forgot later on. So I do have to say, that is my one major issue with the film, just because there, there are some hugely irrational leaps of logic that allow Amy to basically get away with murder. Oh, my favorite, going off of what she's getting away with, 
she says that she got hit in the head. And that is accepted. That is the accepted reason for why there's blood all over the floor. Now, a head wound like that, she'd still have something on her scalp, and she would have been examined all over by the doctors when she came back. I was really mad at Boney for not catching that. Mm -hmm. But you actually, um, going back to the book, uh, I need like a sign that says, I read the book. Um, (laughs) Going back to the book, she actually, she doesn't use the, like, the IV thing. She actually cuts her arm with a knife, and... Okay. Yeah, what she says is... There's an actual wound there. Yeah, so she explains that by saying that when Desi came into the house, first he, like, kind of knocked her out with the Punch and Judy handle, and then when she came to for a bit, she struggled, and he cut her with a pocket knife. Mm -hmm. So she actually, she actually does have to explain her wound in the book. It just kind of drove me nuts. I was like, there should still be evidence of a head wound. <laughs> no, I have I have heard that as well. Uh, I, I saw. I also read one review that noted that her story is much more airtight in the book in terms of really not leaving any loose ends, even though uh, in the book apparently as well, the detective also does realize pretty quickly, okay, this bitch is playing us the whole time. Yeah, she does. And there's, just, there's just less of a case. I felt bad for Boney because... She knew the whole time she's investigating this. She's like, all the evidence points to Nick, but it's not right. And then she finds out yeah. the truth, and they can't get her. They can't yeah. get any justice. And I think the I think the film is certainly playing to our expectation. We ex- we expect this person to, to get her come up, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, while I like I like the fact that she doesn't get her come up in terms of the uh, structure of the film. One part about this movie that I've seen it twice now, and for some reason the first time it didn't bother me, the second time it it did bother me, I think because maybe I was looking for it. Just the thing you mentioned, Noah, about her story doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense. And not just that it doesn't make a lot of sense, the fact that it's dismissed so quick. Yeah. I understand maybe, I understand that there's maybe like commentary on how this is a story they don't want to touch because of everything that's going on. But it does, like, it does start to, you start to lose uh, your suspension of disbelief because it's like, this seems like something that would be investigated. A man was just, yeah. I, she, yeah, you know, she's a it. public figure, though. She's really, yeah. she's got that going for her by being a public figure and by, she goes right ahead and says, it was your fault. If I hadn't escaped, I'd still be there and you'd be executing my husband. So she doesn't excellent job putting the blame on which causes the feds to come in yeah but at the same time i mean at the same time the fact that they wouldn't be the feds aren't that incompetent there would have been more than a few people noticing well we like to hope that (laughs) and we like to hope that happens in real life yeah it's not such a like it is maybe like the major flaw for me about this movie i think this was something that boney would have investigated had she the power She's kind of, she's like, my hands are tied. I, I have to let them take it. And you really see it, and I've seen this as a, a, a knock against the film in that scene of the press conference. Um, or not, I don't know if it's really a press conference. You know, talking to uh, the investigators, some journalists, I guess, talking about what happened to her. You have that one figure, you have the male figure who is basically, who he goes in by saying, I know she's, you've been through a lot, so I'm going to keep this brief. So right from the get-go, we're not getting, we're not going to be privy to what actually happened. It's interesting. The reason, like they cut her, they cut her off. She gets very detailed about how she was down, and that's when he's like, when he decides to cut her off, and that's when Boney can't question her anymore because Boney's ready to go. Like she's not, she's oh, not yeah. giving this up without without a fight, and unfortunately, yeah. You know, she has to, you know, let the let the feds handle it. I, I really like Boney's character, and I really like Margot as well. I mean, you really, if anything, I, I think you see this most misogyny in the movie when Boney's trying to interrogate or to at least flesh out these details. Because you see the mm-hmm. male detectives giving her a look like, look at this poor woman. Why are yeah. you questioning her? We have to protect her. And she's like, guys, her story doesn't check out. <laughs> Her, her hilarious bad cop sidekick. He actually oh, he yeah. he did a little more in the book, but okay. it was sure it was always mostly her. her. Blood type? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, something that I really do love about this film, and it's something that I like about David Fincher's work, and 
And they all, aesthetically, they all come across as very, very, very similar. That's partly because, of course, he has the same two guys, uh, Trent Ratzner and Atticus Ross, doing the soundtrack. And it's the same style. It's, it's the same kind of score. This very, you know, uh, electric, synthetic, uh, very rhythmic score. For each one. So the movies all sound very similar. Uh, and, of course, David Fincher is, is you know, very meticulous in his thoughts. So the, the way they're filmed looked very, sim- looked very similar as well. I get the same vibe because it's almost... Looking at Social Network, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, and now this movie, I feel like they're three pieces of the same puzzle. Uh, they, they just seem to be so visually similar that I can't help but sort of you know look for connections thematically between them. I don't know if any of you guys, if any of you guys have, have any similar comments in terms of David Fincher's visual and aesthetic style as a whole. I haven't seen any of his other movies. It kind of takes me out of the discussion in that sense. You haven't seen, like, uh... Social network or nope. Fight Club or No. I I yeah. don't know. Like, um I didn't have any friends that were really interested yeah. in those movies, so Okay. He does tend to make movies of a certain like flavor. And he's he has an interesting career. Like he started out doing music videos, uh not unlike Jonathan Glazer, who did Under the Skin, or Spike uh, Jones. Yeah. So he does have that background, but you right. I'd say starting uh, maybe, not really with Alien 3, maybe a little bit, but like starting with 7, he really started getting that very grimy kind of noir aspect to his films. Now this movie, I know he's worked with the same cinematographer on this movie, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, I believe also The Social Network, I might have to check that. So mm-hmm. I think that's why their look is somewhat similar. Thematically, there's some similar things. I think you, get, you do get these characters who are sort of hard to, to read, usually, because they'll give you a lot of information on who they are, what their uh, perspective is, what their ethos is. And it's always like, there's always something simmering under the surface. Fincher has never written screenplay, That's but it is interesting that he seems to want to explore these themes. So, yeah, I don't know. There's, there's, definitely, there's definitely similarities, though. I, I think you're, you're not off base with that. Because I, I very distinctly recall even grow up the dragon tattoo and thinking, well, that looked and sounded an awful lot like the social network. <laughs> movie, yeah. I was like, well, that looked and sounded an awful lot like grow up the dragon tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> an awful lot like the social network, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. We can do a, do a quick wrap up and just see and, and just ask for you, anyone for the final thoughts, whether or not they recommend it, anything like that. Justin? I, I'll, I'll be really brief. I love this movie. I think it's, it's extremely rich, even as it's definitely flawed. And I, I kind of touched upon in our discussion, but I love the way it plays with perception, with performance. I think there's limitless readings of, of the dynamic between Amy and Nick. And I, I think there's enough ambiguous about their past together that's interesting to keep exploring. So, and honestly, this is a film right now that seems to have gotten like a lot of like box office. But I think in a few years, it's actually going to have a pretty high critical reputation. Kayla, if, if you are capable of answering... I think it's an excellent movie. I definitely recommend it. I also think it's an excellent book. I do recommend not putting too much stock into the feminist and misogynistic arguments, in my personal opinion. It's a character study, if you want to classify it. Oh, above and beyond, it's a story that forces you to confront your feelings of sympathy for a character that doesn't deserve it, and your feelings of sympathy and disgust for a character who will do whatever it takes to get what she wants. It's an unsettling story, but in a good way. Okay. For myself, I I have to say, in in some ways, so I've spoken about how much this movie reminded me of Fincher's last two movies. It also reminded me a lot of Wolf of Wall Street, in that it's a film that is very, that on a surface level, is very open to misinterpretation or, or to interpreting as a film that kind of confirms certain you know, questionable uh, misogynistic worldviews. But when you really take the time to dig below the surface, you find that there's there's so much in the backgrounds or, or little details in the film that that remind you that it's not that simple. This isn't a straight up misogynistic film, and it's not a straight up feministic diatribe against a masculine society. You know, those explanations or or looking at the film through those lenses is fine, but stapling them to them is number one kind of missing the point and it's also it's it's settling for an easy answer 
Uh, and like a like Wolf of Wall Street, this is not a movie that offers or wants you to draw any easy answers from it. It, it just like it doesn't. It is very opaque uh, in that sense, and I like that, and I, I appreciate that. But it, you know, it gave me a lot to think about, and I always appreciate that. I'm still I'm mulling over wh where or if this movie would end up like end up in my top films of the year list. Like for me personally, I mean, that's I just have to see you know what else comes out this year and how you know how the other movies stick with me in regards to this one. But definitely, just in terms of its its technical mastery and, and the fact that it is a thing piece, it's one of the most interesting films that I've seen this year, definitely, like, on par with Grand Budapest Hotel or The Wind Rises, um, in terms of stuff that, you know, just left me chewing over the film for a while afterwards. Um, yeah, so highly recommended from my end. Cool. This, this will basically conclude our first part, so thank you for listening, and stay tuned.